And welcome back to Link's Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we're going to sit back, relax, take a midweek break. Really, we're just going to sit back, relax, and maybe not relax so much, but we are going to talk about some of the fantastic things that we found going on in the world of Floss. I'm Vin, that's Joe, that's Pedro, and everyone at home joining us live. We're doing the thing we do. Um, Everybody, how's everybody doing? (laughs) Are we having a good week? I mean, it's only Wednesday, so you can't really say, right? Yeah. (laughs) No, I... I'm definitely having a good week. <laughs> see, see, I, I can feel Pedro. Pedro's like, that's giving fate lead in time. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's not tempt karma. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always a little scared about that, man. Uh, yeah. Pedro, what have you been up to, man, since you didn't write anything this week? No, I didn't write anything because, <laughs> well, uh, work's kind of sort of died down because everyone's on vacation. And, uh, yeah, uh, I it, nothing major has been going on here. <laughs> I've been screwing off at work all week, and that's slipped in my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Joe, what's up? Oh, boy. So I had a, a great time once again as a guest with Chris Fisher on on Jupiter Broadcasting's The Friday Stream, where I gave out three Linux Steam game keys to three lucky winners of an online Who Wants to Be a Millionaire game. It's so much fun uh, doing that. And thank you so much to Chris for sharing the Linux love and letting the Linux game pa- cast be part of your streams. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, it's a good thing you got the nicest one of us. Mm. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> we will play with that. Uh, I've been working a few bits on the streaming setup. If you follow me on Twitter, I was up to absolutely no good last night mm-hmm. with splitting out some of the way uh, our network audio and like being able to adjust it per channel because some other things are going to be showing up. And as, as I was saying before, um, we recorded the show in the pre-show was um, things are going to get squirrely and change, but if everything goes right, you won't notice the difference. It's one of those things, but our sync should be uh, a lot better. That's something that's been bugging me. It's easy to fix post-show, but we've not had the ability. It's like, oh, if you change one thing to the other thing, it's the HD mind coders. It's like whatever mood they're in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, it's, it's just encoding the video. Plus, uh, I, allegedly, some new things are showing up for the Optiplexes. Uh, we're going to be doing A-B testing on that. It, it's going to be an adventure. Stay tuned Saturday where I just might be like, nah, I'm out. You guys have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Koala give. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, first thing we need to talk about is the internet. Tried to pull a koala gif on mm-hmm. Manjaro last week. You know, it was yeah. like, hey, they did an update. They announced things. It's like, shut up. That's not the thing we want you to talk about. <laughs> and that thing was um, free office. They're like, yo, we're going to put that in. And oh boy, the internet lost its business as, you know, internet going to internet. Well, the Manjaro team, they got that sorted with a quickness. Uh, there will now be an option during setup. So you can choose between LibreOffice and FreeOffice. And one thing they pointed out, which is why I always like to wait for the mm. dust to settle before I had to start dropping the cluster bombs, is you know, like they didn't pay us. We were just doing this because we're a German company. We wanted to like help boost their footprint. We thought that was cool because they make Linux software. That's a fair reason. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just with what they did was with the RC5 and RC6 images, they had uh, free office there and no LibreOffice. And people were going, oh, mm-hmm. oh, that's going to be the default. No, no, it's not. It, they just did that so people could test it. And, well, some people did test it. And in the midst of uh, all the trolling that happened... Uh, Two good things came out of it. One, which was uh, the Manjaro people, like Fed already mentioned. They're now going to include an option in their installer site. Like, do you want LibreOffice or do you want FreeOffice or no Office uh, suite at all? And the mm-hmm. folks at FreeOffice have gone, okay, everyone's complaining about us not supporting uh, open document uh, 
formats or even docs or uh, XLSs or PPTs. So we're going to add those to the free version as well. It's like, oh, okay, not a bad day then. Well, not yeah. necessarily a bad day. That's one hundred percent a great thing. And it's like, yeah. good on you. I mean, this is what I say about free office. Good on you for making your free version unusable product in the slightest sense. <laughs> <laughs> people could actually Aww. use it now <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you know and i was really you know happy this got sorted and look forward to what the partnership between softmaker and manjaro will bring softmaker has made a lot of inroads in linux especially with the microsoft word compatibility so a lot of companies have been using their products and i think this is really good for manjaro and that's Definitely. one of the things that the Manjaro developers were talking about. It's like, yes, yeah. we know LibreOffice is a thing. We know everyone likes it. But compatibility-wise, with people using Microsoft's Office, free Office is better. Yeah. I don't know in what ways exactly, but I'm sure people will let us know in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's keep the um, arch tree rolling. Yes. So <laughs> yes. there was an article by Dave McKay, uh, and he, well, he just wrote a bit on why he switched from Ubuntu to Manjaro Linux. Pedro, did and we just pick an, uh, pick an article just to argue with it? Is that what we just did? <laughs> well, I was, go I was going to, you know, be positive Aww. about the whole thing and then, you know, lay it on, but whatever. <laughs> so uh, he actually starts out with, you know, the usual spiel that don't take this article the wrong way. Ubuntu is great, but Manjaro does some things better. And one of the things that he mentions, it's, it's faster. Uh, the operating system feels a lot snappier whatever that means nowadays. Uh, and it's a, it basically, it's a lean, mean Linux machine. Yeah, you're just saying it's faster. Again, it comes with less stuff pre-installed, therefore it's just faster. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, uh, he also mm -hmm. mentions the uh, bleeding edge uh, rolling releases for the packages, but then he says that uh, the um, third party repositories, uh, what was the exact quote? Better third-party software repositories. <laughs> it's like, okay, there it is. <laughs> There's something that was, I mean, this is an opinion piece and that his his yeah. opinion, so that that's fine. But it's like, that that's debatable. Mm. Yeah. Uh, his <laughs> argument is that, oh yeah, you have the AUR and you can do everything through a GUI. It's like, uh-huh, that's mm. better. Is it? Okay. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very true, Pedro. <laughs> but I do like what the author Dave McKay states. He 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 said Manjaro feels like driving a go kart you've built yourself. Ubuntu feels like a big, comfy, well-stocked RV. There's something to be said for both approaches. Oh, most definitely. And you know, uh, as as the author was talking about, you know, to be truthful to me. Most Linux distros are zippier than Ubuntu if you compare the default desktops GNOME to GNOME. But if you use the lower memory desktops like I do, Flexbox, Windowmaker, XFCE, you don't no notice much of a st speed difference between distros at all, definitely. <laughs> so. First, I'm the only one on this show that sticks up for GNOME. <laughs> are you now? Because I'm looking at the show notes. <laughs> so you see... If you're about to say something honest, say something good first. <laughs> I defended GNOME. But we got to be real. I mean, um, GNOME, GNOME isn't known for speed, period, on any desktop. No one says, man, I'm going to install GNOME because it's wicked fast. These, these are not yeah. words an honest person says. Um, he doesn't bring up a good point, man. I mean, out of the box, you know, having 24 enabled demons versus 90, yeah, you're right. That could have <laughs> yeah. a little bit of an effect. It might be negligible, but it definitely could be an effect after all. And if you're wondering, you're like, well, what about um, Fedora? Well, Fedora, if I, I was like, I need to check that. Honestly, I'd never check that. <laughs> um, what I'm running right now, I had 89, so. But uh, what do we really think? I mean, it's, it's the benefit of running Arch is, for me, it's not even the AUR. It's the documentation. It's the wiki. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. one of the way back when, you know, more than half a decade ago, probably like seven years ago, I was just running Fedora up to that point and I moved over 
to Canonicals Ubuntu because of the documentation, because I realized how good I was at converting um, apt speak into yum speak and figuring out those differences. And now I find myself more and more having to convert, be it from anything else, because I end up on the Arch Wiki. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> and doing it like that. So I think this is one of the strong suits of an Arch-based distro. But Definitely. here's what you like. It is 2019. Chances are you, at worst case, you have a super slow regular SSD and not an NVMe. So you're gonna oh, or most people <laughs> should, but they still don't. I don't trust them. I like my hard drives to <laughs> fail over time. Uh huh. <laughs> Hi, Seagate. How you doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Spinning rust. <laughs> Dude, Seagates, man. After that uh, backplane uh, report again, yeah, it's like undisputed yeah, that reigning was... champion. Uh, yes. It's like five hundred and something failed drives, and most of them were Seagates. You, you really yeah. do have to play, pray to the god of YOLO if you're populating an ass with those before you. Oh, oh man. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, there's been a fix for a security issue with uh, LibreOffice. Uh, there has, and it was basically when the vulnerability was announced, It was there, the fix was already out. That's not always the case, but that's for the next story. This one, well, it's uh, LibreOffice version 5.6.5. Uh, which was uh, supposed to patch the security hole, is still vulnerable, but they have actually released the proper fix now. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a macro vulnerability, uh, like you've seen in Microsoft Office forever. Basically, since macros were implemented into Microsoft Office, they have been an avenue for getting malware onto people's systems. And this one was not that much different basically the libre logo which is a little bit of functionality that lets you uh, create macros for a libre office uh it can be used to run arbitrary code and they have the proof of concept which is an infected file that you run the macro and it starts up the calculator on windows so it's like oh okay that that that's escaping its own uh, mm -hmm. sandbox and launching another application. Ew, bad labor office. You'd think with, you know, Microsoft's history of macros that they, they, they would have been extra careful. But no. <laughs> hey, man, there's yeah. nothing wrong with a little <laughs> Mac attack every now and then. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the author, Tim Anderson, thought that making a separate ODF document with macros, such as ODFM, would be a good idea, like the DOCM word counterpart introduced in Office 2007. And I actually agree in light of this vulnerability. I think that's actually a really, really good idea. And I really, <laughs> really want the Document Foundation to fix this because I don't want the tutorial, um, the coding tutorial with my turtle graphics in LibreOffice having any similarity with infected Microsoft Office Clippy macros. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> definitely and uh yeah so that's that's uh this uh was was uh this vulnerability comes in hand when you when you run the tutorial um for learning yeah. logos code mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> macros it, it's just like you know you know you've made a poor life decision if that enters your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. like oh, yeah here we are all right, fair enough. Anyway, <laughs> that's not the only vulnerability we're going to talk about. Yeah. No, no, no it's not. And this one is a bit worse it, because it's, it's going to it, cause some mm. physical pain because his babby. That's not. I don't really like Katie that much. No, he does. I prefer it to <laughs> the other desktop environments, right, right, but I don't really like it that right much. Right next to his Justin Bieber poster, it's Katie. <laughs> See, I don't it's hear an immediate straight denial. Straight up black wall. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, this one is a uh, zero-day vulnerability that was dropped on Twitter uh, a couple of days ago by someone who clearly has an agenda. And basically, if you're running KDE Frameworks uh, 560 or below, which is to say basically everyone at this point, because that is the most recent stable version. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this does is a malicious .desktop file, so basically a shortcut in Linux. Uh, it can load arbitrary code from the thumbnailer script that the uh, KDE Frameworks uh, makes use of when it 
reads the dot desktop file it's like okay there's the icon line i'm going to grab that icon that it's pointing at and if it's not an icon that it's pointing at but instead a um a malicious uh intent thing then that will uh very much trigger this particular vulnerability now it is very unlikely that you will uh be downloading dot desktop files off the internet you shouldn't be doing that anyway and this just makes it worse the annoying part is <laughs> let's say you're downloading a git repo of something and it just so yeah. happens to have a pre-built dot desktop file in one of the folders that you're not even aware that it's there you're just cloning the repo and then you navigate to the folder and um the frameworks goes through the folder looks at all the files assigns the mime types loads up the icons if it has any and your system is now running whatever uh they decided to script so yeah that that that's mm -hmm. that's a big no-no and the annoying really annoying bit is that the person decided you know what i could have reported <laughs> this to kde and said you know i yeah. he, you guys have a flaw here fix it but no he decided twitter i'm going to make this a zero day now done 100 <laughs> percent. yeah what you just said <laughs> i back and I always back that right up. And this is not always the case, but how many times have we heard it later comes out? Yeah, I reported that six months ago and they haven't done anything. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's a horrible thing to do, but sometimes you're like, this is an active thing that needs to get fixed. Yep. Yeah. Which I don't, I'm still not supporting it, but I, if that turned out to be mm. the case, if this guy's like, boom, yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah. And that's what he did. <laughs> uh -huh. And, the, you know, the, the, this exploit can also be hidden in zip and tar files, which all of yep. us download and we all trust, <laughs> you know, as far as uh, Linux goes. And um, the researcher who found the vulnerability, Do Dominic Penner, didn't contact the KDE team beforehand because he wanted to drop it zero day before the DEF CON security conference this week. So um, that was his reasoning. And I thought uh, Ven had a nice insight on that as well. Definitely. Right yeah. On. See, trying to push that. Oh, yeah, DEF CON is coming out. So I'm going to drop a zero day. I'm going to get <laughs> internet points for that. It's like, no, dude, mm -hmm. you're just an ass. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't very nice. Yeah, I was watching the um, <laughs> keynote this morning and the dude was doing like some analogy between like trees and what I was like, nope, can't do it. It was very no. It was terrifying. I look forward to the talks, though. Always like watching. Yes, those. definitely. The best desktop mm -hmm. ever made. Period. No argument. Isn't that right, Internet? <laughs> That's right. Um, Four fourteen pre three is out. This is the final pre release. This is you know they said, hey, we don't even know if we're going to release this, but they're like, we're going to give you some extra time, kick the tires, and play with everything. Uh, you know, there's updates to session, window manager, Thunar, the panel, all this business, power manager. That was kind of interesting. It was like, okay, because mm -hmm. apparently there could have been some type of argument, you know, if you're running another power management demon. But uh, this is going to take care of that. Hopefully everything's going to get hammered out. And I think they're going for the end of August release of this. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, Jill, I know you were saying that, yeah, there were definitely some mm -hmm. updates to XF Window Manager 4 to, I'm running pre-2 right now. I'll be running pre-3 probably by the end of the week. And I really want to get rid of Compton. Not because I mm -hmm. think Compton's bad. It's just a bit of a hack to, you know, it's like, well, make sure that launches on startup. And sometimes Compton and the uh, Light DM don't like each other. So part of starting this particular box is Control-Alt-F2, Control-Alt-F1 mm -hmm. to get back. Mm -hmm. do everything and everything works you know they've added you know hardware acceleration <laughs> where it's not all hammering the cpu 99 percent there man except for when i have chromium or brave or vivaldi anything running chromium has a stutter mm. when you scroll which makes me mm. a yeah. sad panda <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well they did include support for the long-awaited xfce4 screensaver which is integrated <laughs> with the XF Our uh, wait is over. <laughs> <laughs> it's finally I here. <laughs> I know. It's just they've been talking about it for so long. So now it's here. And, um, you know, was added in this release. 
And the XFCE4 panel has had many bug fixes to its plugins as well, including taskless fixes for the new group indicator, the directory menu, and clock. Yay, we could always use fixes to the clock. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, like Ven was saying, like that of XFMW4, the XFCE4 for panel has also has compositing issue fixes and includes fallback for missing icons. So that's that's really awesome. That that definitely was an issue. <laughs> oh, what yeah. what are all these icons on my desktop? Oh, wait a second. That oh, was yeah. labeled labeled computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of 100 percent with you on yeah. Ethereum on that screensaver in 2019, to which I'll just be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you hate the environment? Oh, but it, it's it's so great because you can have the can, you can. Have... You are literally killing seals because you want to look at something pretty on your screen. Well done. You can, you can and have when the you wiggle, the Regentia OS <laughs> mouse going across your screen. Isn't that cute? Remember, kids, if you don't hate the planet, set your screen to timeout. Do use a screensaver. All right. Anyway, moving on, uh, real quick, because I wanted to throw this in from its fossil. All this is going to be in our show notes, you know, if, if Joel can take a break from, like, killing the environment. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding slightly. Uh, this is something I've always assumed I knew, but I never genuinely looked into it. And this was clarified. You can check it out in the show notes if you want the full deal. Uh, the difference between apt and apt git, which I always assumed the difference was the dash git, Pedro. <laughs> yeah <laughs> although there was that thing about the progress bar is like oh that's different okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> i definitely gonna say for the end user what's the difference it's basically for you at home playing the home game if you're not doing anything but installing stuff it, it's the dot git or the dash git um mm-hmm. you know because app was just made to simplify things and 90 percent of the time i've learned to use it i mean it tries to simplify the command structure uh as far as like with the queries and there's just not much to report on. I, I was a little that, sad. That's the progress I, bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, There's there it is. <laughs> I, I was a little sad to just find out. It's like, yeah, I, I wasn't missing anything by not looking into this, but this is a TIO. And what did I learn? Not much. Uh, I mean, there's a slight difference in some of the commands, Pedro. Am I wrong with saying that? Uh, the Again, the commands that most people run uh, are the same, but app does have uh, app lists and apt edit sources, which are, they don't work with apt get. But it's um, the thing that I, when apt started to become a thing and I noticed that on the Ubuntu installs, I had, it's like, oh, so uh, <laughs> what happened to aptitude? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I guess. <laughs> yes. You, you put in that. A, <laughs> aptitude. <laughs> Aside from being the thing I never remember how to spell correctly, it's usually on try two or three before I get that. But that yeah. could be directly related because I'm in such a mental state because you, that that that's the launch codes. That, that something's went wrong before you get there. Mm-hmm. And for me, like aptitude is like this step right before it's like, all right, I'm just going to clean the kit and build this thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or if you're trying to resolve a weird situation to – which always irritates me a little bit when aptitude's like, I got this. And I'm like, why don't you mm-hmm. other guys got that then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing. Yeah. Aptitude was implemented exactly for the same reasons that the article describes apt as being introduced. Exactly. It provided <laughs> similar functionality to apt-get, but it had a different uh, command line interface. You had different flags. You had different options. And it would let you do more things. Uh, but I guess... uh, typing down aptitude is a bit of a mouth uh, fingerful, I guess. A mouth (laughs) fingerful. Yes. Uh, And the, with apt, you just put in three letters, like apt done. I gotta ask you a serious question though. Yeah. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Which finger? What, 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 what? A mouth fingerful. Which finger, man? Don't let me hang it. All of them? Like, (laughs) what? That's not fingersful. No, I don't listen to anything. Uh, bad and wrong. Uh, snap time. Ooh, yeah, yes. so uh, the popular and powerful digital signage platform Zebo comes to Linux. 
because of popular demand and launches as a snap. Awesome. Uh, Zebo's content management sy system can be self-hosted or cloud-based and um, also supports the Linux-based LG WebOS smart TVs and Samsung's Tizen smart TVs, which are some of the top selling TVs in the industry. So that makes sense. And, you know, we've, We've uh, we have lots of digital signage op options um, under Linux, but this is this was one of the most uh, highly rated out there. So I was really happy about this, definitely. And I, it's it, digital signage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the environment that yes, snaps and other containers make sense because you're going to set that and forget about it until it breaks and make it wicked easy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. This mix. Yeah. This is the yeah. is as close as you could get to a desktop ish like use case. But mm -hmm. I, I assume this thing is this client server. How does this thing run? Yeah. So um, if it's self hosted, of course, you don't have to have to uh, pay a fee. But if, if you use the cloud based option, you pay a monthly fee. Mm. And it, it was relatively inexpensive. But. Um, you know, it, it, they and they support uh, multiple uh, screens at the same time, which is really nice. All right. Yeah, which some okay. of the other options under Linux don't support <laughs> multiple screens. <laughs> I don't know, man. You, you could be oh. vintage and just like make your own <laughs> banners, like we did back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That's the yeah. and all right. It exists. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, before yep. we get into a slice of pie, we have to thank some people uh, for making this show possible. They're the ones who finance our shenanigans because we do this without ads. And that's really awesome. We like to keep it that way. Uh, starting mm -hmm. with our latest Patreon. Uh, who is that, Jill? Yeah. So we have Cowbird Boy, who is our new Patreon. Although years ago, I remember seeing him in IRC chat. So, But now he's officially a patron of ours. Thank you so much, Cowbird Boy. <laughs> That's beautiful, and I hope it's accurate. It's like, what are you talking about? Um, yeah, 114 I, I, beautiful party well, patrons get us $257 a week for all the things we do, which is this show, Saturday night, Tuesday streams, Thursday streams, and Friday streams. You do it a couple of things we like to throw in there, access to our Discord and um, anything that we're going to be. Some of the stuff we're going to be doing in the studio, which is going to be some alchemy stuff. That'll probably go up a week early, um, just as a thank you for helping us make this possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got Wish Zones. Pedro's got one. Jordan's mm -hmm. got one. I got one for the studio. Bunch of boring stuff. You guys have straight up enabled cheap mode. We're way ahead of where we would have been with our little budget. And um, T-shirts. Mm -hmm. Those are awesome. Yay. Clothe yourself and questionable merchandise that'll make people <laughs> ask you, like, what's that about? I'm like, I have no idea, but I just watch it every now and then. <laughs> 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 and it's kind of brilliant. But, uh, Pedro, uh, you, you, you got a new thing. You, you opened up your mailbox and somebody was like, hey, man. <laughs> I'm going to poison you. Wait, no, they're not. They're going to give you a... Nice. <laughs> no, the other way. Oh, right. Yay, AT2020. Pedro. Yes. <laughs> it's an XLR version of the uh, T. Brown Memorial microphone that is currently in front of me. And it came with a really, really nice note. And uh, I realized that as soon as I pulled it out of the uh, packaging, there was also like a card. <laughs> A gift Aww. for you. <laughs> so uh, the card reads the same as the note, which says, I've been listening to your podcasting work since 2015 and have enjoyed your unique perspectives on what's happening in the Linux <laughs> well, world. Well, at least, you know, A, he's got a sense of humor and B's messing with you, right? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's from Chris B. And uh, seriously, Chris B, clearly we don't agree on everything, but uh, thank you. Thank you very Aww, much. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, a man in Tanzania who's about to leave Tanzania uh, kicked mm -hmm. us over another thing that. Yes. <laughs> they, anything that requires me to like crawl around and do work shows up. This is a. Uh, <laughs> if you look to the left, Jackbox is now literally in a box. It's a cube box. It's the. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a stool. <laughs> you can sit on it. Dude. Corsair. Hundred <laughs> percent. That's the. Uh, I think. 450 or 540 d i forget which one it is um mm. it's a big mm. cube and it's got like the power supply mm. in the back very specialized case i would not recommend anyone buy this case unless you need something quiet with a lot of room 
because yeah. it's effectively an open air case. It has got like some suggestion mesh on the top <laughs> and some suggestion mess. And it's a suggestion for the dust not to fall into it, which didn't dust like whatever. <laughs> um, and then on the back, I'm like, I'm going to add a filter to the uh, fan supply. But what it does, it has 340 millimeter fans and options to put more that I can barely spin because something we have to do is keep that box cool because that's doing all the audio, but it can't be loud. Which is always a fun yeah. challenge. So thank you, Linux Neuro. Continue to Yay. be awesome and save journeys. Um, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Back to New York. That's it's good. I, I, just pop in Discord and watch that happen. <laughs> so kids, slice pie time, and this one's full of diabetes and happiness. So yes, mm, cherry pie, so, <laughs> <laughs> yummy. So this is computer vision for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and, you know, in the past, it has performed very slowly in, until this device, the Luxanos Depth AI, came along. It uses a carrier board to mate a, a Myriad X VPU and a suite of cameras to the Raspberry Pi compute module. The Myriad X is a vision processor capable of doing real-time object detection and stereo depth at over 30 frames per second. And here's uh, Ven showing one of the, the cameras. There's two grayscale cameras that um, actually measure the depth, even though that's in color. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so it bypasses the Pi's CPU and sends data via USB, which gives it five times the performance boost using the Intel Myriad X chip. And what's really cool is the goal is to make a device that helps bikers avoid dangerous collisions. Awesome. And, you know, Whatever, to me, Jill, this, this is like predators hunt humans. It's all this. Yes. Is. Yep. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting because it's using two grayscale cameras for depth and then regular color camera um, to uh, define, you know, define the objects. And but it uses the, the heat from from the objects. In depth. <laughs> that, that didn't make any sense. So I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like you got a mouthful of finger, man. I did. Just like yep. Pedro did. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pedro. I swallowed your fingers. <laughs> oh, it was you this whole time. Dang it. This is where I have to sadly remind everyone I'm the responsible one on this show. <laughs> Think about that real hard. <laughs> This whole time, Jill. This whole time. Yeah. Uh, yes. But yeah, no. It's it's really awesome. It's basically you give uh, your pie a pair of eyes to get that depth perception with an actual camera to it, and you can make that. Basically, you can put that to use in so much stuff. And mm -hmm. the thing is, like Jill mentioned, they made this for the compute module. Um, that the intention is for it to be used along with the compute module on whatever the device uh, the compute module is plugged into, but you can also run it through USB. So, yeah, if you have yeah. something like this, <laughs> and if you don't have a compute module or anything that could run the compute module, you can run it with a regular Pi. <laughs> yes, and you too can hunt down Arnold or Glover. <laughs> yes. Get to the chopper. Man, they really should make a third movie in the Predator <laughs> series, shouldn't they? <laughs> yes, oh, no. they should. Yes, right after they're done with the sequel to The Matrix. Um, <laughs> yep. Hey, if you want to tell us about your movies, ideas, thoughts, sense, allegations, or maybe just a suggestion, head over to our contact page. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and... Like Ven said, you can leave us all of your uh, plot suggestions for that movie that you've been dying to uh, actually get produced. But just be sure to pick LWDW when you hit the, the uh, contact page, because that's how you can send some feedback our way. And we will be more than happy to feature a little trailer for that movie. Uh, if it's you know safe for you completely YouTube. off site, so <laughs> um, here, here. just in case I haven't made you feel old during this episode, the 20th anniversary of the Matrix re-release in theaters. Awesome! <laughs> it's coming up in a few days, I think. That's exciting. Oh, yeah, actually. it was the 90s, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't remember leaving the movie oh, film theaters like fighting with your mates? You're like, ah, right. 
I was in college. It was 1999. <laughs> I was, let's see, 1999. What, no, 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 did you was... reach over and pause your Smash Mouth CD and be like, oh, man. 13? Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, now. I can barely remember. <laughs> All right. Uh, first bit of kit comes from Nathan, who writes... Uh, this came from Facebook. You can send us a message it, it, here. You can leave it on. Yeah, the, to Patreon. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Behind the scenes, Patreon. I was like, what's this? <laughs> we didn't even know that was a, it's like, that's built yeah. Apparently, you can send us messages. Like, because Facebook's like, you're a company. I'm like, okay, fine. And then Facebook's like, give us money or we won't tell. And I was like, we're not giving you money for oh. See, I didn't. Curse, almost did. Um, <laughs> Nathan writes, it's a question about the interface that we use uh, to bring you our uh, dulcet tones. The FCA 1660 is like, I'm looking for a FireWire interface uh, to actually record eight inputs. I'm about to convert our multimedia studios to, uh, and you know, post-production stack over to Linux full time. Good on them. Uh, you know, he's thinking about using traction waveform. If our door can't handle um, like eight simultaneous tracks, uh, they don't want inputs because, you know, you, it, you're going to eat up eight if you're just uh, miking a drum kit, period. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking like rhythm guitar, scratch, vocals, mm -hmm. everything else. Uh, he wants to know, will this fire, firewire record all eight or more inputs simultaneously? Really don't want to record a live band, da, 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 and we have to redo it. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go, Van. <laughs> well, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why do you ask me something I don't know anything about? Um, <laughs> you'd think this would be right up your alley you would right yes um, <laughs> hey man i've had people that yeah no i should do it. i'm like okay um mm -hmm. here's the thing short answer any any class compliant um interface basically made in the history of pc ever is going to work with jack on linux out of the box just plug it in you're done so you got to do. Uh, however, you'll notice how I didn't say it's like after you get Jack set up, this can be another issue, but it's normally not bad getting it tuned. Um, now, the exception being for interfaces that require uh, additional software to use like internal effects stacks or anything like that. Um, PreSonus says some of those like we install our stuff and we have built in compression and stuff like that. That software, you're not going to be able to access that functionality inside the interface. However, more often than not, 12 times out of 13 the interface itself is going to work. And that's what you're looking for anyway. Uh, now, pro audio recording and the emphasis on recording, because I don't know the situation about making beep boop music, and I know some people are down with that. I'm not knocking that. I just don't know anything about it. Uh, that It's extremely mature. We're talking well over a decade. Go to linuxmusicians.com and look hey. at the conversations, and you're talking about in legitimate studios. We're not talking about my studio or something like your home studio. We're talking... Pro stuff. Uh, that's where you see NetJack and stuff like that deployed. Um, now, this is despite a lot of self-proclaimed professionals, you know, who bought the uh, like their first Scarlet 2i2 Tinker Toy interface, and they're like, "I'm a recording professional. Nothing works under Linux." After extensive research that I clearly didn't do, um, I've dealt with that a lot online. Um, now, when it comes to recording outdoor. How many tracks and buses can it deal? All I always say is how many cores you got, as many as you can throw at it. 100%, like right now, right now, as you're hearing this, we're recording six tracks, but the interface is processing 11 because it's dealing with a mix minus uh, and switching all that fun stuff. Uh, let's see. And for any of you, though, if you want, why are you talking about fire? Why did, why did Nathan bring up Firewire? Because this is audio. And something you got to understand, audio technology moves at a glacial pace compared mm -hmm. to like PC hardware, which compared to pretty much anything else, PC hardware is like, pfft, pfft. and I was like, I bought that two <laughs> weeks ago. And I was like, get that old hack stuff out of here. Uh, we have, you know, and, you know, with audio stuff, if it's not broke, don't fix pretty much the law. And this is where you will genuinely still run into Firewire devices. <laughs> a lot of the pro stuff, fire phases and stuff. We're talking to stuff that starts on the low end at 1200 bucks. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's what you're dealing with. Um, and, and if you're buying something like that in 2019, it's probably going to be Thunderbolt. And if not, and I'm not saying you need a lot of money, you can find used Firewire devices. You can find a cart. Look on our Amazon store thing list that we've put together. It's mm -hmm. got everything that we currently use. You can get that for like 30 bucks. You can get a used interface. 
Better way your interface like focus right, even if you're like, I want that anyway, for like a hundred dollars. So go ahead and, and you want some you now USB two works. I would say up to four channels. You're probably not gonna have a bad time, but you are going to have weird and unusual headaches with like it works better in this port, which can be true, unfortunately. Oh, like, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So keep all that in mind. And if you're gonna be buying an interface, uh Regardless of who you are, if you're in the States, go to guitarcenter.com. I know, knee-jerk reaction musicians like, no, but <laughs> go to their use section because they have the, every store they have, their inventory is clocked into that thing. And I've gotten so many good deals off of that, especially if you're like, I want to buy that Scarlet 2i2 that I'm not, it's a great product. It's just, you're buying the perceived value of just like, $150 more than what it's worth. If you want to buy it for what it's worth, get it used. You can get it for like 75 bucks instead of 200 Pro tip from old man Vin. Now, up next, <laughs> Sunar crashing. Yes. Yeah. So up next, we have Trobadur. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, yeah, they're asking about, uh, Thunar. It's like, this is mostly aimed at Ven, who seems so infatuated with the XFCE set of applications. Granted, I am too. If any of you use Thunar as your main file manager, how do you deal with it crashing so often? Mount a remote file system, crash. Remove files by the hundreds, becomes unresponsive. <laughs> this is probably due to the GVFS backend, though. And some random crashes out of nowhere. It seems this is a known issue. I've, uh, I've even started learning C in order to attempt to fix it. But the code base is so complex, uh, it will take me years. Ugh. Love you all. Keep up the good work. Less than three, less than three, less than three. Aww. <laughs> First off, if it's going to take you years to fix something, you pick the right project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, at that trajectory, you were 415. You were right on track, man. Um, here's what I'll say. Uh, GVFS, nothing but headaches for Thunar. Mm -hmm. I mean... Not I don't just Thunar. Well, Okay. <laughs> I've, initially when i because you know we have a 10 gig link between uh the thread booper and jackbox because many reasons and i was like okay well I'll set up gvfs and he's in uh, uh i mean things like jackbox needed to be on before i could cut on the thread ripping system or if i'd open thunor if it would disconnect it would cause weird hangs and just mysterious like i know what this problem is and so I just quit dealing with that. I went, uh, I just use SFTP and Pedro and I are both, um, SSHFS. If you want, if you want to get sexy yep. with it, mm -hmm. that's one way to do it. Um, but as for mass deletion, uh, I think Katana left a thing here in the notes too. I, it's like, I've never even considered that. Hey, each to their own. <laughs> it's, I don't trust yeah. myself enough with a GUI. I, I'm yeah. Get off my lawn. Um, yeah, not don't act. control A, shift, delete. <laughs> yeah. I would never, yeah. plus it takes so long. I was like, this is so much uh -huh. quicker just to start at star with a little RM sauce thrown on it. Gone, done. All right, next. Instead of like, oh, collecting files to be deleted, waiting, da da da, da 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 da, da. <laughs> yes. like, nah. -uh. Um, but that could very well be a problem with Unar. I wouldn't know. Um, Jill, you got some thoughts, though. So. Oh, Oh, yeah. I've had, actually had Thunar crash when deleting lots of uh, video files. How dare you slander files. Thunar? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I haven't experienced as much cra crashing as our, our feedback um, uh, person has, but, but Troubadour. So, but I have experienced uh, that a lot when deleting lots of files. So I kind of... I haven't been using Thunar that as much anymore. I mostly use PC ManFM and MLFM2 as my file managers of choice. And what's nice with PC ManFM, you can go directly into a uh, console um, as well as as well as uh, MLFM2. So that's a nice option. And you know the upcoming XFCE 4.14, like we just talked about, is supposed to have a lot of Thunar bug fixes, and I hope hopefully we'll fix some of your your crashing. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah. I haven't had a lot of uh, Thunar crashing because I didn't use XFCE a lot. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I have seen very similar behavior is in that Dolphin. Why it takes so long for you to get something. Oh done? yeah, Dolphin. <laughs> oh. 
but I've seen very similar uh, behavior in uh, in Dolphin, especially if you're using the GVFS backend to try and mount uh, anything over the network. Uh, it it tends to just freeze. It's like, oh, okay. It's so how about kill, and then the entire uh, KD desktop crashes at the same time. Oh, neat, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. SSHFS, uh, like Ven mentioned, also uh, mm-hmm. SFTP. Yeah. I just use the only reason I'm using SFTP right now is because I already had SSH set up on Jackbox and I'm yep. lazy. I need to like log into that <laughs> once a week and I'm just like, boom, save that bookmark in Thunar, drop it right there. So, the password, <laughs> so I just click on it. It's like, I'm in. Yeah. That's why I always pick SSHFS when I mount like network stuff right. on Dolphin. Like I said, lazy. Always. If I wanted to be fancy with it, yeah, I'd be in, you know, FS town. <laughs> like add that line because that is my preferred wave. Like, uh, well, what about setting up Samba? And I'm like, maybe you just need to get to a box to get a thing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By all means, use Samba if you have a dedicated NAS. Yeah. Right. 100%. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> on that. Um, beautiful, beautiful um, recounting of our ways of navigating our own small local area <laughs> networks. We're going to go with some credits and maybe get out of here. Well, thank you, everybody. For Indeed. Sure. Indeed. Can we pull it off <laughs> just a time? Credits. No. no. Yay, credits. credits. <laughs> no credits. No credits. Oh, well. Uh-oh. All the love. <laughs> You're stuck with our faces. Aw. Thank that you, for Ben. Credits? Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can find credits. <laughs> I made credits. And thank there you to our executive producers <laughs> and producers. Ah. We love you. Ah. Science. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> uh, you don't even need uh, Samba for printing nowadays. <laughs> yeah. You Whoops. just... Cups. You just pair the printer <laughs> with whatever Wi-Fi you have going on, and then you go, add a new printer. This is also... Oh, yeah. there's a network printer. Right. Do you want to add it? <laughs> yes. We're living in the yes. alternate reality where you it's have a plug and play. in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A, a printer I use once a year for scale <laughs> to print out flyers and tutorials and <laughs> Marie's still in school, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, she uses it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>